Hello and welcome to this edition of HRTV. I'm Tim Tialdo. If you're a teenager, did you hear what I just said? According to hearing scientists at the University of Minnesota, less than 20% of U.S. teenagers would have difficulty hearing the sound of my voice as a result of exposure to loud noises like live music. The newly released study determined that the prevalence of hearing loss in U.S. teenagers is much lower than what was reported in a Journal of the American Medical Association study published in August. That study found that in 2005 and 2006, one out of every five U.S. teenagers had a hearing loss due to noise exposure. The University of Minnesota research, to be published in the Journal of Speech, Language, and Hearing Research, measured the hearing of members of the university's marching band and found that 15 percent had hearing loss. But the researchers then followed the band members over the period of a year. And when the results of multiple hearing tests were averaged, more than half of the apparent noise-induced hearing losses disappeared. Dr. Bert Schlock, a professor in the university's Department of Speech, Language, and Hearing Sciences and co-author of the study, said the small hearing losses audiologists are trying to identify with conventional hearing tests, which are subject to measurement error. He said as many as 10 percent of children are falsely identified as having noise-induced hearing loss using these methods. The authors suggest these false positive tests have led to overestimation of hearing damage from loud noises. Now, that doesn't mean exposure to loud sounds is good for your hearing, Schlock said, but the damage from exposure to gunfire, personal stereos, live concerts, and other loud noises may build up over time and not appear until a person is older. If you are one of those older people with a hearing loss and you live in the state of Michigan, here's some good news. A Michigan Senate committee has approved a state hearing aid tax credit, which could establish a new trend in helping U.S. citizens pay for their hearing aids. The bill, sponsored by Detroit Senator Tupac Hunter, provides a tax credit of up to $1,500 for the purchase of a hearing aid by a person over 60 years old or for a dependent. To qualify, the individual must have household income of less than $100,000. Senator Hunter said giving the tax credit to qualified senior citizens is good public policy. No one, he said, should miss out on what is happening around them because of the cost of a hearing aid. The bill is supported by the Hearing Loss Association of Michigan, the Michigan chapter of the Alexander Graham Bell Association for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing, and the Hearing Industries Association of Washington, D.C. In Washington, meanwhile, Texas Republican Representative Pete Olson is pushing federal legislation that would provide a $500 tax credit per hearing aid or up to $1,000 for a set of binaural aids. That credit would be available once every five years. The hearing aid tax credit bill currently has 125 co-sponsors in Congress. Olson said the bill's wide bipartisan support makes it easier to attract the attention of House leadership when major tax legislation is considered. Olson plans to work for passage of the bill in the final months of his congressional session or in the new Congress that will convene in January. Also on Capitol Hill, Congress has passed legislation guaranteeing access to all forms of media for people who are deaf, hard of hearing, blind, or vision impaired. President Obama recently signed the 21st Century Communications and Video Accessibility Act into law, setting new federal guidelines for the telecommunications industry. Representative Edward Markey, a Massachusetts Democrat and the House sponsor of the bill, said the legislation will provide online ramps to the Internet for people with disabilities. Here are some things the new law will require. All television programs must be captioned for the hearing impaired when delivered over the Internet. The top four networks and the top five cable channels must provide seven hours a week of TV video description for vision impaired people. And all televisions and set-top boxes must have accessible user controls and easy access to closed captioning and video description. In an age when equal access to Internet services is an absolute must for most people to successfully earn a living and enjoy a high quality of life, the new Accessibility Act is seen by most hearing and vision advocacy groups as a giant step forward for people with disabilities. In a related story, passage of the 21st Century Communications and Video Accessibility Act is one reason why the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics believes the profession of stenographic court reporting will grow by 18 percent over the next eight years. Court reporters, who also serve as broadcast captioners, can translate speech to text at speeds of 225 words per minute or faster, according to the Virginia-based National Court Reporters Association. Because the new law requires any program that is first broadcast on television and then distributed via the Internet to include co closed captioning, there is likely to be an increased demand for skilled court reporters. 
In addition, a growing amount of video content will be broadcast live in the years ahead on both television and over the Internet. Those court reporters will help millions of citizens who are deaf or hard of hearing gain access to television programming via the Internet. Devices that display videos such as smartphones, MP3 players and DVRs must also be capable of closed captioning and displaying video description and emergency alerts. Using a sophisticated system of symbols and abbreviations, broadcast captioners enter shorthand into their real-time stenographic machines which filter the information through a computer and simultaneously display it on a video screen or monitor. The system ensures that those who are reading rather than listening to a program never miss a moment of the action. Today's broadcast is brought to you by ReSound Alera, the world's first truly wireless hearing aid. Better noise reduction, better environmental control, better feedback management, the best sound quality on record. Easy to fit, easy to wear. For more information on Alera, visit gnresound.com. In other news, Odix Global, the parent company of Sonic Innovations, has brought the bidding war for its company to an end. William DeMont Holding was chosen over rival GN Store Nord as the one that Sonic will merge into, according to a statement made on October 19th. Odix, the parent company of Salt Lake City-based hearing aid maker Sonic Innovations, said it would be filing a definitive proxy statement to obtain approval of the merger with William DeMont Holding by its shareholders. The break fee was the deal maker. If Odix ended its deal with William DeMont Holding, they would have to pay a $2 million fee, making their offer more valuable than GN Store Nord's. The move by Odix just makes the statement by CEO of Odix, Sam Westover, more relevant. On September 13th, he said, In a short period of time, Odix Global has grown up from an innovative startup company to a leading manufacturer and distributor of superior solutions under its Sonic and Hearing Life brands. Our product lines have garnered industry attention and awards and are representatives of the innovative technology for which Odix is known. The merger with William DeMont will provide the research and development, marketing and sales support, and resources necessary to further expand Sonic and Hearing Life's presence in the hearing health care industry. Do you know where your audiologist is? A study published in the June edition of the Journal of the American Academy of Audiology addressed the issue of whether it is safe for senior citizens to self-refer to an audiologist for hearing loss evaluation. The answer, according to David Zavala, Ph.D., and colleagues at the Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville, Florida, is yes. Some clinicians have been concerned that audiologists might miss significant otologic conditions. The study looked at records of 1,550 Medicare-eligible patients who were referred to the Mayo Clinic's audiology section in 2007 with a complaint of hearing impairment. The researchers determined that 95% of patients who saw both an audiologist and an otolaryngology practitioner received thorough and effective treatment. Meanwhile, 78% of those who received audiology services alone needed no other treatment, and 9% of those patients were referred for a subsequent medical evaluation. According to the study, the findings are consistent with the premise that direct access to audiology services would not pose a safety risk to Medicare beneficiaries complaining of hearing impairment. And finally, research from New Zealand's University of Auckland, published recently in the International Journal of Audiology, shows that hearing aids in conjunction with counseling can help patients with tinnitus. The study examined the effectiveness of hearing aids and counseling on 29 patients with gently sloping sensory neural high frequency hearing loss. The authors concluded that counseling combined with hearing aids results in twice the reduction in tinnitus handicap that would be expected when relying on counseling alone. Thus, the combination of hearing aids with counseling represents an effective tinnitus management tool for many patients. In the study, the authors generally used open-fitted slim tube hearing aids. Real ear probe microphone measures were obtained to verify the fittings. The tinnitus handicap questionnaire was used for pre- and post-treatment measures of tinnitus. That's all for this episode of Hearing Review TV. Thanks for watching and listening. A special thanks to our sponsor, Resound US. For more information on these stories and the latest industry news, visit hearingreview.com.